Hello everyone, my name is Joyce Brown. I'm a CDBG project manager for IEDA, and today we're going to be discussing lead-based paint regulations. Lead safe housing rule basics, defining the problem. Lead is a naturally occurring element and found in manufactured products. It is also found in all parts of our environment. A few of those are listed below, such as water, ceramics, painting, lead fuel, pipes, industrial facilities, and batteries. Defining the problem, who's at highest risk? Children under age six, their bodies absorb more lead and are more sensitive to the effects than adults. They are more likely to accidentally ingest lead. Pregnant women, elevated blood lead levels in a pregnant woman can expose the developing child Certain workers, workers in certain construction in industrial fields may be exposed to high levels of lead. Be careful to prevent take home exposure. Damage caused by exposure to lead. On this slide, you will see there is a diagram of an adult in a, in a child and a, each is listed as to how Lead exposure can damage that organ of the body, and you will see how they differ between children and adults, such as the brain of an adult could be memory loss, lack of concentration, headaches, irritability, depression, whereas in a child, the brain could be behavioral problems, lower IQ, hearing loss, and learning disabilities. Children in exposure. How do children get lead in their blood? Playing in soil or on floors with lead dust from friction and impact surfaces, such as doors or windows, or people, for example, not taking off shoes and bringing in dust from the outside. Putting objects in their mouth or eating paint chips, as you see in the photo. What is the trigger level of lead in a child? and the trigger level is five micrograms per deciliter. Lead Safe Housing Rule, or short LSHR. The purpose is to protect children in assisted target housing throughout primary prevention. And the definition of target housing is defined as any housing constructed prior to 1978 except housing for the elderly or persons with disabilities or any zero bedroom dwelling unless any child who is less than six years of age resides or is expected to reside in such housing. Lead regulations apply except when properties constructed after January 1st, 1978, zero bedroom units or SROs, which stands for single room occupancy. This is in the works to be removed. Housing designated exclusively for the elderly or persons with disabilities unless if a child less than six resides or is expected to reside there. Properties found to be lead free by a lead based paint inspection or where all lead based paint has been identified, removed and clearance achieved. An unoccupied property that is to be demolished provided that it remains unoccupied until demolition. Emergency action necessary to protect life, health, and safety, or further damage to the structure. An example would be after a natural disaster or fire. This exemption does not apply to restoration or rehabilitation of such damaged property. And subpart K does not apply if the assistance being provided is emergency rental assistance or foreclosure prevention assistance that is 100 days or less. This exemption expires 100 days after the initial payment or assistance. <clears throat> 
limited exemptions from lead safe work practices and clearance. Rehab that does not disturb painted surfaces and lead safe work practices are not required when minor maintenance or activities disturbed painted surfaces that are less than the de minimis levels. The de minimis levels are described as two square feet per interior space, 10% of a small component type such as a windowsill, or 20 square feet for exterior work. Note, HUD's de minimis levels are more protective than EPA's RRP guidelines. Federal lead regulations are twofold. HUD's 24 CFR Part 35, Subpart A is the lead disclosure rule, Subpart B is the general lead safe housing rule requirements and definitions, Subparts H, J, K, L, M, cover the lead safe housing rule program requirements, and subpart R, cover the lead safe housing rule methods and standards. Whereas the EPA's 40 CFR part 75 also has a lead disclosure rule in subpart F, subpart D, L and Q cover the lead based paint activities rule, and subparts E and Q cover the renovation, repair and painting rule also known as RRP. HUD regulation subparts. You'll notice off to the left, there's a list of subparts. The center is the assistance type, and the right is lists all of the programs that are affected. So for example, subpart A in the assistance type is disclosure of known lead-based paint hazards upon sale or lease of residential property, and that applies to all programs. The next slide continues this, where you'll see subpart J, which we're most familiar with. The assistance type is rehabilitation, and again, that covers all programs. PHI is public and Indian housing. CPD is community planning development, just to list a few of the acronyms that you'll see listed here. Federal lead regulations, HUD and EPA's lead disclosure rule requires disclosure or known information on lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards before the sale of or lease of most pre-1978 housing. HUD's lead safe housing rule, again short, LSHR, applies to most pre-1978 target housing that is federally owned and or going to be receiving federal assistance. EPA's renovation, repair, and painting RRP rule requires that performing renovation, repair, and painting projects that are going to disturb lead-based paint in most 1978 homes, child care, preschool, and child-occupied facilities to obtain firm certification and use certified renovators. Key definitions, again, target housing. Any housing constructed prior to 1978, except housing for the elderly or persons with disabilities, unless any child who is less than six years of age resides or is expected to reside in such housing for the elderly or persons with disability, or any zero bedroom dwelling. Lead-based paint, paint or other surface coatings that contain lead equal to or exceeding one milligram per centimeter squared. Lead-based paint hazards are deteriorated lead-based paint, dust with lead levels at or above the dust lead hazard standard, soil with lead levels at or above the soil lead hazard standard, friction, impact, or chewable surfaces with lead-based paint in an associated dust lead hazard. Deteriorated paint is any interior or exterior paint or other coating that is peeling, chipping, chalking, or cracking, or any paint or coating located on an interior or exterior surface or fixture that is otherwise damaged or separated from the substrate. Key definitions continued. Interim controls. The, this term means a set of measures designed to reduce temporary human exposure or likely exposure to lead-based paint hazards 
including specialized cleaning, repair, maintenance, painting, temporary containment, ongoing monitoring of lead-based paint hazards or potential hazards, and the establishment and operations of management and resident education programs. Abatement. Any set of measure designed to permanently eliminate lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazards. Abatement includes the removal of lead-based paint and dust level has lead hazards, the permanent encapsulation or enclosure of lead-based paint, the replacement of components or fixtures painted with lead-based paint, and the removal or permanent coverings of soil lead hazards. And two, all preparation, cleanup, disposal, and post-abatement clearance testing activities associated with such measures. Act means the Lead-Based Paint Poisoning Prevention Act as amended. Clearance examination, an activity conducted following lead-based paint hazard reduction activities to determine that the hazard reduction activities are complete and that no soil lead hazards or settled dust lead hazards are defined in this part exists in the dwelling, unit, or worksite. The clearance process includes a visual assessment in collections and analysis of environmental samples. Dust lead standards for clearances are found at 30.5.1320. Key steps in the lead-based paint compliance process is to disclose, look, treat, clear, and tell. To disclose, you must make sure that you offer a pamphlet. To look is to do paint testing, risk assessment, or inspections. To treat is to repair, interim controls, or hazard abatement. Clear is to conduct clearance. And tell is to notification to owners and rehabs of the results. Housing Rehabilitation Programs Federally affected programs are most pre-1978 properties, owner-occupied single-family rehab, multifamily rehab, acquisition and rehab, weatherization, disaster recovery, and CARES Act. Programs buildings not affected are those with emergencies, repairs that do not disturb painted surfaces, unoccupied until demolition, inspected units with no lead-based paint, elderly and disabled housing, and zero-bedroom units, again, with no children under the age of six residing in or expected to reside in the unit. Exterior repair programs are not exempt. Exterior repair beautification programs usually in the $5,000 to $25,000 range. In many cases, programs incorrectly assume interior lead hazard control work is not required and skip testing and hazard control work. Lead rules for $5,000 to $25,000 range require risk assessments. If results indicate lead-based paint hazards on the interior, paint or dust, interior control work to, to the interior hazards is required. Historic preservation, limited exemptions, properties listed to eligible for the National Register, if required by SHPO, may conduct interim controls instead of abatement. You can follow the guidelines as noted in the Historic Preservation Brief 37 or our HUD Guidelines Chapter 18. Rehabilitation Summary which is some part J of HUD's 24 CFR 35. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, you'll notice it will give you a list of those items that we are wanting to compare across the different ranges of rehabilitation costs. For example, approach to lead hazard evaluation and reduction. If you look under projects that are less than 5,000, you'll see that the idea is to do no harm. 5,000 to $24,999, you will see that you have to identify and control lead hazards. If your project is equal to or greater than 25,000, you must identify and abate lead hazards. 
notification notification to the owner or tenant you'll notice is required on all levels of costs again ebl which stands for elevated blood lead level requirements there is no requirement to notify if you find that a child is an ebl presumptions less than five you could presume lead-based paint site work practices on all painted surfaces five thousand to twenty four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars presume lead-based paint and or hazards and standard treatment on all painted surfaces is required greater than or equal to twenty five thousand you can presume lead-based paint and or hazards but you must abate all applicable services How does lead of levels of rehab assistance influence evaluation and lead hazard control requirements? For prior you may presume or test disturbed painted surfaces and repair surfaces disturbed during rehabilitation. Projects that are 5,000 to 25,000, you may presume or test disturbed painted surfaces, conduct a risk assessment, Conduct interim controls or abatement of all hazards. If presumed, use standard treatments on all deteriorated and friction and impact surfaces. For those projects greater than 25,000, you may presume on or test disturbed painted surfaces, conduct a risk assessment, and abate all hazards. Remember, anywhere lead is found or presumed, lead safe work practices, clearance, and lead hazard reduction notice is required. Options, presuming the presence of lead-based paint. In projects where you, under the cost of $5,000 where you are presuming all surfaces to contain lead-based paint, you must repair all painted surfaces. In projects that are 5,000 to 25,000, you can do, conduct standard treatment for the entire unit. And for those that are greater than 25,000, you must abate applicable surfaces. Notice of presumption. You must provide within 15 days of, pres of presuming lead-based paint a report that identifies the location of your presumptions. The notice form must include bare soil, dust locations, other presumed lead hazards, both interior and exterior, such as windows, doors, trims, walls, floors, ceilings, fences, cladding, outbuildings, porches, and etc. LBP evaluations, paint testing. Paint testing determines if painted surfaces actually contain lead-based paint using methods such as an XRF analyzer or lab analysis. The purpose is testing painted surfaces to be disturbed. If no inspection conducted, any painted surfaces that was not replaced after 1977 must be assumed to contain lead-based paint. On a risk assessment, you identified lead paste paint hazards, sampling of deteriorated paint, dust, bare soil, risk for a risk base, and water, which is optional. Purpose is for to conduct interim con sale of property or turnover, documentation of absence of lead hazards. And the final report is the lead, lead hazard control plan with options for interim controls or certification of lead based paint compliance. The lead-based paint inspection is a surface-by-surface -surface investigation to determine if lead-based paint is present above HUD's thresholds, not if lead-based paint is an immediate hazard. The purpose, abatement, renovation, weatherization, sale or turnover of property, remodeling or repainting. The final report, whether lead-based paint is present and where it is located and at what concentration. Combined risk assessment and inspection may prove more cost effective than separate investigations. What is a risk assessment? On site investigation to determine the existence, nature, severity, and location of lead based paint hazards must be conducted by a certified risk assessor. Visual inspection to locate deteriorated paint, including extent and causes. 
background information on physical characteristics of dwelling and occupants patterns that may cause lead based paint exposure to a child that is less than six years of age. Test for presence on each friction or impact surface with deteriorated paint. Dust samples from windowsills and floors and soil samples. Note, risk assessor must have the preliminary rehab specs in hand to perform a proper risk assessment. What is a risk assessment report? A risk assessment report by the certified risk assessor or firm conducting the risk assessment explains the results of the investigation and options for reducing lead-based paint hazards. The report includes the summary of the property, basic inspection information and results, full explanation of testing mythology and results, lead hazard control plan, detailed laboratory analysis forms, and data including XRF, data. Lead hazard evaluation notice. Single family building, a full report is provided directly to the homeowner. If the unit is tenant occupied, the tenant must receive the notice of evaluations as well. Multifamily building, distribute to each household or post in a central location where all residents can access it. Documenting the results. Notice and reports of all evaluations must be made available to residents if requested. Timing, notice must be provided within 15 days after results are determined. Lead hazard reduction. If five project is less than $5,000, again, repair surfaces disturbed during rehab, and the lead hazard treatment would be Surface inspection, applying new co coat of paint, worksite containment, specialized clearing, and clearance. For projects that are 5,000 to 25,000, a set of measures designed to reduce temporary human exposure or likely exposure to lead based paint hazards. And you can conduct interim controls, which are temporary reduced exposure to lead based paint hazards and can include repairs painting, temporary containment, specialized cleaning, clearance, ongoing maintenance, management, and resident education. For projects that are greater than 25,000, set of measures designed to permanently eliminate lead-based paint hazards. An abatement is permanently eliminate lead-based paint hazards, which can include removal, enclosure, encapsulation, replace components, all preparation, cleanup, disposal, and post abatement clearance testing activities associated with such measures must be included. EPA's Renovation, Repair, and Painting Rule, again short for RRP. Contractors performing RRP projects that disturb lead based paint in homes, childcare facilities, and preschools built before 1978 must have their firm certified by EPA or an EPA authorized state, which Iowa is one of, use certified renovators trained by EPA, approved training providers, follow lead safe work practices, provide renovators rights pamphlets, which the picture of the pamphlet is in the lower right hand corner, in violations to not comply with the RRP rule could be civil money penalties, which is $41,056 per unit. Monitoring construction. In addition to regular monitoring, check for the occupant protection measures, worksite preparation, daily cleanup, safe work practices and avoiding prohibited practices, and worker protection, which is the employer's responsibility. Clearance. Clearance is a hazard reduction work is only complete upon passing a clearance examination. Must be performed by a certified risk assessor or lead-based paint inspector, or a sampling technician supervised and signed off by such. Purpose is to assure work was done as specified and site is clear of hazards. 
no conflicts of interest. Clearance examiners must be independent from hazard control, rehabilitation, or maintenance work. They may work work for the same firm that provides pre-work paint testing or risk assessment. Interim clearance to allow for non-lead workers to enter site is okay, but a final clearance must still also be done. Dust wipe samples must be collected by certified risk assessor or his or her clearance technician and submitted to an accredited laboratory for analysis. Lead-based paint hazard control is not complete until clearance testing is performed and passed. And the list of clearance levels for particular items are listed below, such as floors, window sills, and porch floors. <coughs> clearance continued. Clearance includes a visual assessment to determine completion of work and absence of hazards dust sampling, which processes by an accredited lab to measure residual lead dust levels, interpretation of sampling results, and the preparation of report. If the site fails, worksite must be recleaned and another clearance test conducted. Additional work may be needed if there is a continued clearance failure. Notice of hazard reduction includes clearance results. Occupants must receive a notice of hazard reduction within 15 days of completion of work and the pass of clearance. So the report will show you the activities performed, clearance data, technician's ID information and contact information, the visual inspection results, dust location of where the samples were taken, lab ID and number, the reduction dates, the lead-based paint remaining, and the contractor's ID. Key steps of rehabilitation implementation. There are eight. One is the program application and interview. Two is the property inspection and specification development. Three is the contractor selection. Four is the work phase coordination. Five is pre-construction conference. Six is the progress inspection. Seven is the final inspection and clearance. And eight is post rehabilitation. So we'll start with one program application and interview. Must provide a pamphlet, renovate, write important lead hazard information for families, child care providers, and schools. Explain program requirements for housing quality, lead hazard reduction, and cost limitations. Determine the owner's desire for rehab project. Explain the process for development of the final project specifications. Explain the requirements for occupant protection. And determine the owner's ability to limit use of property or to temporarily relocate during work. Number two, the property inspection and specification development includes the scope of work is based initially on the rehab or repair needs of the property and requirements within the program. Lead hazard reduction measures and costs may add to the scope of work. Some work can be considered rehab or lead hazard reductions, such as window replacement. The cost estimate breakdown will determine the required level of evaluation and hazard control which is the age of the property, property condition, and use of lead-based paint. Capacity and coordination on specifications. Ideally, the specification writer, in-house or out, will be qualified as a certified risk assessor. The spec writer must be knowledgeable about measures and methods to control lead hazards, as well as the associated costs. The reconciliation of all docs may lead to changes. A risk assessor should participate even if lead-based paint is presumed. The level of assistance during specification design. Single-purpose non-lead may fall below 5K, but could easily go over triggering whole house hazard reduction. 
roofs, HVAC replacement, major structural or plumbing, rewiring, rebuilding porches, ADA work, those types of activities. Certain major expenses may qualify as hazard reductions and keep the level of assistance low, but may not significantly reduce testing, worker qualifications, and lead safe work practice requirements. Number two, property inspection and specification development evaluation. Lead hazard evaluations require Again, projects that are less than 5,000, paint testing. Those that are over 5,000, paint testing and risk assessment. Options to presume lead-based paint and limited options for lead hazard screen. Certified professionals conducts the evaluation and can certify staff or procure. Program must notify occupants of results or reasons for presuming. Notice of lead hazard evaluation or notice of presumptions must be given within 15 days. Rehabilitation options, presume versus evaluate. You can presume lead-based paint rather than evaluate, but hazard control measures are enhanced and potentially much greater costs are incurred at levels of assistance rises base decision on swabs and or local experience. In actions in presuming those projects under $5,000, again, lead safe housing work practices and clearance required for all painted surfaces. Those that are 5,000 to 25,000 are the standard treatments, same methods as interim controls, but must be applied to all interior and exterior deteriorated paint, including friction and impact surfaces. Those that are greater than 25,000 abate all interior and exterior deteriorated paint, including friction and impact surfaces and soil interim controls for exterior not disturbed by rehab. <coughs> Excuse me. Number four is the work phase coordination, trades coordination and scheduling. Plan timing and sequencing of rehab and hazard reduction. Interim clearance is allowed when lead hazard control work and or deteriorated lead-based paint removal are completed and the site is appropriately cleaned. Whether and when to relocate occupants and subsequent rehab work by untrained workers may not disturb paint. Must clear entire site again at final. Rehabilitation Implementation and Compliance Stage number five, which is the pre-construction conference. This includes roles and expectations, the work schedule, responsibilities and coordination, the work method, and special contractual provisions. Number six is the progress inspections. Periodic inspections of work site occur during and at completion of work elements. Do staff on projects have proper certifications? Are PPEs in use? Are lead safe work practices being followed? No prohibited method, methods, working wet, working with HEPAVAC, dust captures tools. Proper containment or work sites, dust control, signage, are they there? Occupant protection in place, are they protecting the homeowner's belongings and the homeowners themselves? They must conduct HEPA, VAC, plastic, tape, cleaning equipment, and supplies on site ready for containment. Occupant protection during lead hazard reduction. Occupants and their belongings must be protected during lead hazard reduction work. May include leaving the unit or temporary relocation until clearance is achieved. Relocation is required when tenants are required to be out of the unit and cannot return until clearance is achieved. If work area can be contained, but the resident will be restricted from needed parts of the unit, such as kitchens and bathrooms, for more than an eight hour workday, relocation would be required. A program must decide how and if to reimburse for relocation costs for owner occupied. When is relocation not required? 
Work not, does not disturb paint. Interior work is completed in one period of eight daytime hours. Only exterior treated. Occupants have safe access to unit, including sleeping area, bathroom, and kitchen. Treatment completed in five calendar days. And an elderly occupant after consent. Does temporary relocation trigger URA? Tenants are covered by URA because they are involuntarily participating. All of out of pocket expenses will be covered, including temporary housing, storage, and other related costs. Need to be provided notices per HUD's 1378 handbook. Owner occupied, generally, they are not covered by the URA because they are voluntarily participating. Grantees will need optional relocation, not URA policy, to define the temporary relocation benefits. Although this is non-URA, the LSHR requires protection of occupants and their possessions during lead hazard reduction work. Rehabilitation implementation and compliance continued. We will cover seven, which is the final inspection and clearance. Prior to final clearance, grantees should ensure that all specified work is complete and satisfactory, all lead hazard reduction measures and cleaning are completed. Inspectors must be careful not to contaminate the work site after clearing. Cleaning, excuse me. No less than one hour after work has been completed, you must conduct your clearance exam. And who conducts a clearance examination? Clearance on all projects involving abatement, as defined by EPA, must be done by a certified risk assessor or certified lead-based paint inspector. For properties covered by HUD's lead safe housing rule, clearance of non-abated work may be performed by a certified risk assessor or lead-based paint inspector or a certified sampling technician. Clearance report and notices. Occupants must receive a notice of hazard reduction, including contact information and date of notice, hazard reduction activities performed, lead-based paint remaining, and clearance results. The report must be sent within 15 days of completion of the hazard reduction work, and work is complete when clearance is achieved. <clears throat> Subpart J's requirements for ongoing maintenance which is post rehab. Property owners of rental units assisted with home funds must incorporate ongoing lead-based paint maintenance activities in regular buildings. A documented visual assessment for deteriorated paint, bare soil, and the failure of hazard reduction measures must be performed at unit turnover and every 12 months. Owner must request in writing that rental occupants monitor lead-based paint surfaces and inform them if a potential hazard were to occur. Exceptions. If lead-based paint inspection indicates no lead-based paint is present or a clearance report indicates all lead-based paint has been removed, the property is exempt from the lead-based paint maintenance requirement. Ongoing maintenance, if there is remaining lead-based paint. If any lead-based paint remains after the abatement, ongoing maintenance must be included as part of the ongoing building operations to ensure that interim controls have not failed. Disclosures, <clears throat> issued to new tenants prior to the execution of leases, along with disclosures required with testing and clearance. Records, must maintain to document the initial lead hazard reduction or abatement work completed on all units and the ongoing efforts to maintain compliance. Deteriorated paint, identified by the visual inspection or interior and exterior surfaces located on the residential property shall be stabilized unless tested to determine it if it's not lead paint. Bare soil, treated with interim controls except bare soil tested and determined to not contain lead hazards. Safe work practices used when performing any maintenance or renovation work that disturbs lead-based paint and clearance achieved. 
and failed enclosures. Encapsulation or enclosure of a lead-based paint that has failed will need to be addressed and clearance achieved. This, for example, would be if you were to wrap a window on the exterior of the building and the, had a wind storm and that encapsulation became loose, you would have to go back and make sure that that encapsulation is repaired. Subpart K. Subpart K covers acquisitions, leasing, support services, and operations man programs. The lead disclosure in subpart A applies to almost all pre-1978 for sale or rental units. Occupant and buyer must receive the pamphlet that you can see to your right. Proper disclosure forms must be signed and all known information, lead-based paint, evaluation, hazards, and remediation must be disclosed. Must be completed and signed copy retained before any contracts are signed. Subpart K considerations. If the visual assessment identifies deteriorated paint, it must be repaired or stabilized. If the area of paint to be disturbed exceeds the HUD de minimis levels, then certain requirements apply. The buyer owner may test the paint and if no lead-based paint is found, proceed without further requirements or may presume the presence of lead-based paint and use qualified contractors following HUD's protocol. Paint stabilization using lead safe work practices. Paint stabilization means the remo to remove loose paint and other materials from the surface to be treated, repairing any defects in the substrate of the painted surface, causing paint to deteriorate and applying a new protective coating or paint. Safe work practices are detailed methods for controlling dust, protecting occupants, segregating the work area in HVAC and cleaning effectively. Work wet, clean wet, clean with a HEPA vac. Must be followed by formal third-party clearance inspections and notice to residents and comply with EPA's RRP rule. HUD's lead safe housing rule is actually more stringent than the RRP in some ways. Clearance and notices. Clearance of non-abatement work performed by a certified risk assessor or a lead-based paint inspector can be certified sampling technician in limited situations and some variations among states. No conflict of interest, which means clearance examiners are independent from hazard control, rehabilitation, or maintenance work, but they may work for the same firm that provided pre-work paint testing or risk assessment. Occupants receive a notice of lead hazard reduction within 15 days of work completion, must include the contract information and date, activities performed, lead-based paint remaining, and clearance results. Home buyer programs affected. Home ownership programs funded by home and CDBG. Potential home ownership assistance programs could include down payment assistance, closing cost assistance, loan guarantees, subsidized interest rates, and finance acquisition. Which subpart is triggered? Subpart K, which is acquisition and rehab under $5,000. Subpart K provides more stringent requirements for rehabs under $5,000 lead hazard reduction, paint stabilization on all deteriorated paint surfaces in clearance before occupancy, whereas subpart J, acquisition and rehab over 5,000, you must conduct a risk assessment, paint testing, interim controls, lead safe work practices on painted surfaces to be disturbed, and review rehab requirements already listed in the recording. Determining levels of rehabilitation assistance. Level of rehabilitation assistance determines the required approach to lead-based paint testing and lead control measures. The amount of rehabilitation assistance is lesser of the two. Hard costs of rehab from all sources per unit, they, uh, it, it excludes soft costs and lead hazard control or federal assistance for all uses 
per unit. We've got a sample. Level of assistance example, a family is purchasing a home. They are receiving $10,000 in assistance for down payment, closing costs, and rehabilitation. The hard costs of rehab are $4,500. You'll notice the blue circle says hard costs of rehab for all sources per unit is $4,500, and the federal amount for all uses per unit is 10,000. The level of assistance is $4,500. So subpart K would be triggered in this instance. The requirements for the acquisition and home buyers, for example, the approach to lead hazard evaluation and reduction, that would be to identify and stabilize paint. Are you required to give a pamphlet? Yes. Are you required to do notification? Yes. On the lead hazard evaluation, you must conduct a visual assessment. Lead hazard reduction would be paint stabilization using lead safe work practices and conducting clearance. Is ongoing maintenance required? No, not in this particular situation. Is elevated blood lead level requirements a requirement? No. And options is to test deteriorated paint. Use safe work practices only on lead painted surfaces. Home buyers implementation. The first step would be the application to determine basic eligibility, provide information and education, select applicants, provide an opportunity to distribute the pamphlet to protect your family from lead in your home, and educate potential home buyers about requirements. The second part would be the home selection. Lead education as a part of any counseling or orientation helps home buyers identify and evaluate potential homes. Final home approval to program depends on physical inspections for decent, safe, and sanitary and visual assessments. Contracts must include options for buyers to inspect and request repairs. Third is the purchase contract. Seller must provide disclosure statements and home buyer option to evaluate risk assessment or paint testing per subpart A. A buyer may also opt for visual assessment. If lead-based paint hazards are found in the found, the home buyer can withdraw from the contract and select another home or renegotiate the contract but not necessarily without penalties. Options depend on specific language in the contract. Contract and or repair request should specify RRP, SWP, and clearance. Four would be to conduct a home inspection. Inspections after offer is accepted. The visual assessment for deteriorated paint in pre-1978 homes conducted by a trained visual assessor, an inspection report to home buyer and agency. Five is the purchase negotiation and addressing lead hazards. Before purchase, lead hazards must be addressed. Any painted surface that fails inspection must be stabilized. Work must be performed by RRP, RP trained or supervised work. After work, HUD-approved clearance must be conducted and must be certified third party that conducts that, required before occupancy, and the home buyer must receive clearance and notice of lead hazard reduction activities. Six is the closing, documents receipt of the lead-based paint pamphlet. Now we'll talk about the leasing support services and operations in the pro these programs affected. Typically, these activities are found in special need programs funded by CDBG, HOPWA, ESG, or Continuum of Care. Programs may include acquisition or leasing of residential properties, support services, and operations related to residual structures. Special cases for rehabilitation greater than 5,000, refer back to subpart J. For tenant-based rental assistance, or known as TBRA, see pub, subpart M. 
The LSSO housing regulations or the leasing supportive service or operations, you'll see those listed off to the left hand side approach to lead hazard evaluation and reduction for leasing support services or operations. You can identify and stabilize deteriorated paint. Are pamphlets required? Yes. Is notification required? Yes. The lead hazard evaluation can be conducted through a visual assessment. The lead hazard reduction is paint stabilization, lead safe work practices, and clearance. Is there ongoing maintenance? Yes, if ongoing assistance is provided. And options would be to test deteriorated paint if lead-based paint is not identified through XRF or paint chip sampling, no lead safe housing work practices or clearances are required. LSSO housing implementation. The initial action would be to do a visual assessment by a trained inspector, plus program required property standards, HQS or equivalent program requirements owner notification of the visual assessment results, paint stabilization and cleanup, RRP certified contractor or workers, and clearance prior to occupancy, which is conducted by a third party. Ongoing actions would be the notice, uh, lead-based paint hazard pamphlet, disclosure forms, test, presumptions, lead hazard control, and clearance. Ongoing maintenance of painted surface was, would be incorporate into your building operations, visual assessment every 12 months or at turnover, and paint stabilization within 30 days of notification by a tenant. Remember to keep good record keeping. Subpart K leasing versus subpart TBRA or the tenant-based rental assistance. Subpart K includes Activities may include short-term emergency payments or payments of deposits for eligible tenants. Typically does not constitute an ongoing rental subsidy for tenants, but might include ongoing support to the operator. Maintenance is required and eligible units must meet property standards. Whereas in subpart M, which covers the tenant-based rental assistance, it's ongoing rental assistance, which is tied to the tenant rather than to the specific location. And tenant-based generally is provided on an ongoing basis, not an emergency payment of 100 days or less. Allows eligible tenant families to locate and rent privately owned housing, and eligible units must meet property standards. Emergency payments. Emergency payments are subject to subpart K, not M, but is exempt for first 100 days. Exemption from conducting a visual inspection and impossible clearance actions prior to providing the emergency payments to keep the tenant in their current unit. A 100 day exemption is tied to the unit, not the occupant. So the program administrator should keep a cumulative number of days of assistance in mind. Example, if a resident has assistance in January and moved out in April and a new resident applies in April, the exemption no longer is applied since more than 100 days has passed. CDBG funds provide, provided as an emergency payments can be utilized to assist a household at risk of eviction, maximum of 90 days. CDBG CV emergency payments the CARES Act CDBG CV funds are being used by grantees to address the impact of COVID-19. Short-term housing assistance is being provided. CDBG CV notice includes a waiver of three-month limit to allow for up to six months of emergency payments. Subpart K only exempts this activity up to 100 days. If CDBG CV funds are used for emergency payments for rental or mortgage payments that exceed 100 days, a visual assessment, paint stabilization, and clearance testing will be required. Other exemptions may apply, such as unit construction constructed on or after January 1978. And this is the end of lead-based paint regulations. If anyone has questions, please contact me at joyce.brown at ie or at iowaeda.com, or you can call me at 515-348-6209. Thank you.